Around the world, more people are concerned about their country creating its own central bank digital currency, or CBDCs. And there are a number of countries around the world that are experimenting with these. And yet, there's a few countries who've given up on their projects, and there's some where the people have just said, we're not gonna have this, and the projects have failed. We're gonna talk about one of those countries today. We've talked about countries where I spend time, where Nomad Capitalist has people working for us, where we have experienced countries like Serbia, where the government just hasn't really talked about creating a CBDC. And by the way, Serbia is not the country that we're talking about. But it's interesting that as someone who's spent a lot of time in Serbia and kind of understands the perspective, Westerners might come to Serbia and say, why don't you smile more? It's just a different kind of culture. It's a bit more of a hard culture in that part of the world than what you might be used to if you just live in California or, or Sydney. And yet it's because of that, it's because of the historical challenges that people have faced where they say, our culture doesn't want stuff like that. There's a certain issue of, you know, hard times create soft men and you know, soft men create hard times kind of thing that countries that have a certain hardness to them prevent this kind of thing. But I wanna tell you about a particular country, in this case, Nigeria, where the actual citizens' distrust of government surveillance could actually stop CBDCs. This is from Techopedia, which says, the real world use of CBDCs will depend on how governments address citizens' concerns about government surveillance, with countries around the world taking different approaches to rolling them out. And while CBDCs can potentially increase financial inclusion and efficiency, says Techopedia, distrust of government surveillance could undermine their adoption. So the first thing I think about here is, uh, I read, one of my favorite books that I've talked about before, The Culture Map. And they explain why, you know, being late is more acceptable in Nigeria. And like, how do you negotiate, you know, between different cultures? One of the things is how acceptable is lateness. And the author said, you know, she met a Nigerian once and he explained like when stuff in your country doesn't work, when the power grid could just go down, but like you can't rely on stuff, you kind of learn like, hey, maybe somebody be an hour late and that's not really a big deal. What I like about a country like Nigeria, what I like about a country like Serbia, any country that's you know had some kind of uh, difficulty, any country that's perhaps emerging that hasn't lost sight of what makes things work, is they push back more on the government. And I think that you know there's more of a cultural understanding that the government's not here to help you there than even in people who are like more on the right wing in a country like the United States, where I'm from, because. You know, I spent many years in the United States uh, running a business adjacent to the talk radio industry. And I had a lot of time, you know, met various talk show hosts from Bill O'Reilly, Laura Ingram, spent time in that ecosystem. And I saw the listeners there. And for all the talk of how we're going to take our country back and we're going to fight to the death and all this stuff, it just kind of struck me like a lot of YouTube commenters who just kind of puff their chests out and say stuff. Whereas when I've been in these emerging countries, people like really as part of their soul just are like, yeah, the government's not here to help us. And I think even though Nigeria is a big country and big countries often just have kind of more of this authoritative attitude in many cases, I think there's a difference between uh, a country with a culture of we don't trust you and a culture where it's generally like, yeah, well, okay, like the government's not that bad, which is even more so in Canada or Australia, even if you think you're part of that minority that doesn't think that. So Techopedia talks about distrust of government surveillance through CBDCs. They mention U.S. citizens are not the only ones expressing concerns about privacy, control, political misuse, and even cybersecurity. Your money could get a cyber attack. But they talk about Nigeria and its e-Naira program. Naira is the currency of Nigeria and how it struggled to gain acceptance. Saying an example of other citizen concerns hindering adoption is Nigeria's e-Naira, the first CBDC in Africa. Now, Africa is a continent that I understand a lot of people may not want to move to. It's kind of this place that people look at as not only you know, not even a collection of countries, but like this one entity, Africa. And a lot of people don't see some of the up and coming countries, a lot of the opportunities. There's obviously plenty of countries that are kind of stuck in a lot of problems. And yet Africa is in some ways a continent where eh, there's going to be opportunities to live freely because people are just off the grid. People want to be left alone. The government doesn't really have this iron grip on power. I'm not saying you should move to Africa, but it's going to be interesting to watch what as an investor and, and as someone who values freedom, what happens there. But this e Nairo was introduced in October of 2021. The Central Bank of Nigeria promoted three objectives for the digital currency, increased financial inclusion, 
facilitating remittances and bringing people into the formal economy. Now, here's the interesting thing. One of the things they say about CBDCs is, hey, this is going to help the unbanked. And if you look at statistics in a Western country like the United States, like a lot of people who are unbanked want to be unbanked. They're not looking for some like weird like digital money. They just they, they want to keep their money under their mattress. There's a certain percentage of people who just don't want to be banked. If you look at a lot of countries in Europe, they have like postal banks. Like who's unbanked? Like unless they really want to be. In a country like Nigeria, you can argue, I mean, this is why they've gone directly to kind of you know, people using cryptocurrencies, people using these fintechs. I mean, they've kind of skipped over the whole legacy banking system in some regards. And so you could argue, oh, you know, CBDCs might have more of that impact there. It might actually be believable that, hey, we're trying to include people in the financial system and people still wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, the country's informal economy accounts for over half of its GDP and 80% of its employment. Not so saying that's a great thing, but you know, obviously a different system than what's happening in the West. However, an IMF report a year after the launch showed that only 860,000 wallets were created, accounting for more than uh, just 0.4% of the 224 million population. That soared to 13 million wallets in March of 2023 as the country faced a cash shortage driven by the central banks replacing the Naira notes in circulation. But that's still 6%. So the government came in like, all right, all right, they're not going for the uh, they're not going for the wallets. Like maybe we can wrap it up in like in some uh, some cheese, some meat, wrap it in bacon, some poisonous bacon. We'll take away all the notes out of circulation. They'll have to do it. They got six percent. I really think like go to Canada, go to Australia, go to, just just look at the last five, ten, twenty years. Go to like most of these Western countries. You could just be like you could put in a memo, you could put a a letter in people's post box, and you get six percent to sign up on the first day. Like, please, we want whatever the government is offering for our protection. Like more than six percent, okay? But they they went through a lot of nasty stuff. They got six percent. Nigeria has become, says Techopedia, one of the biggest cryptocurrency markets in Africa, as individuals use digital coins and tokens to head hedge against a rapidly de depreciating fiat currency, avoid capital controls, and generate income amid high unemployment. Obviously, you want to store your money in some kind of asset haven. Could be your own country, so it could, be, could be someplace like a Singapore or a Switzerland. There's, you know, new up-and-coming kind of smaller asset havens for smaller amounts of money. We've talked about Georgia. You can open a bank account there. It's not an asset haven per se, but you know, if you put a little bit of money there, that could work. I'm not suggesting you go and get a bank account or you go and put all your money in Nigeria. I'm sure there's a few interesting companies to invest in in Nigeria. Obviously, the country does have some problems and what the government's doing here. And I hate to see people you know, suffering through this, but what I love about these kinds of countries is people have a response. I've said from day one of Nomad Capitalist, some of these countries, there's a forced entrepreneurship. And you see it, 80% of the employment is in the uh, the gray market. There aren't enough jobs. People have to figure it out for themselves. Obviously, I'd like for those people to be more successful. We do that in a very small part here at Nomad Capitalist, hiring people all around the world, including in countries uh, where unemployment is higher. Uh, but these people understand, what has the government ever did for us? And before you say, well, my country's not Nigeria, do you think your country's really looking out for you? Because they have the cojones to come and say, we need to help the unbanked who don't even want bank accounts in many cases. By the way, they could follow what Bernie Sanders said in the U.S. And he said, we need to have a postal, a postal bank. Like everything should be like in Europe with Bernie Sanders. You think in a country where it cost a billion dollars to be elected president, you think that's any less corrupt? And so the e-Naira launch came nine months after the central bank effectively banned cryptocurrencies, uh, which were used to fund anti-police brutality protests that swept through the country, right? So where have we heard that before? We've heard that in Canada, where some people had a protest and they froze people's bank accounts. The difference is, I think these people were probably a little bit more ready for, like, the government's not going to like this than people in Canada. Like, oh, we're so free. Yes, as a lifestyle, I'd rather live in Canada than Nigeria. Now, there's plenty of places I'd rather live in Canada. The places that I live in, I'd rather live in Malaysia to live in Canada. I just feel better there. At least in Nigeria, they realize, like, yeah, the government's not on our side. Critics of the e naira pointed out that it runs on a private blockchain with nodes only operated by the central bank and its trusted parties rather than public blockchains that crypto users are familiar with. They wanted the crypto. Unlike centralized cryptocurrencies, the e naira works like a regular centralized banking app. And it goes on and on and on. There's some, there's some suggestions here in case you're a, uh, a brutal politician who wants to know how you can address your citizens' distrust. You know how you address uh, the distrust? If, if you're the end user, if you're the person with the distrust, you uh, you address it by going where you're treated best. Obviously, 
Nigeria shows that just because your country's emerging, your government's not going to make the right decisions. It's a big country. It's never been a country that's been our, on our radar. But, you know, things like clear regulations around this, things like your politicians standing up and passing laws, I'm not convinced that solves the problem. I mean, the U.S. has had clear regulations from Indian tribes to more modern finance. They haven't followed their own laws. They haven't followed their own constitution. They really do whatever they want with this veneer of a constitution. There's a constitution in every country. My advice from this is there are people, there are places where people don't really trust the government that much. I'm sorry to tell you, even if we agree, I got to tell you the truth. Most Western countries, the average person, you know, they have their little grievances. They like to complain every once in a while. That was the talk radio thing I worked around. Oh, we like to complain. But overall, they trust the government. That's why their first go-to thing is, if you don't like it, move to Somalia, move to Russia, move to North Korea, move to China. That's what their thing is, right? Because implying our government's so great because it makes them feel comfortable. It's part of their identity. I want to have a place where people are, I do things independent from the government. I do things independent from the national, from my nationality. That's kind of what I take away from this. The people in Nigeria did not want a CBDC. And to me, there's really not a lot of different. I mean, there are some differences, but this to me shows you need to find some of those places and put them in your portfolio. Get a residence permit, for example, in a place where people just, they don't trust the government. By the way, I think if you're looking at somewhere that's in Europe and people are going to complain, that's not really in Europe. Turkey's a place. Obviously, part of Turkey's in Europe. You can get citizenship by investment there. Buy some real estate. Put some money in the bank. Either one of those gets you a passport. Get your money out in three years. Keep the passport now. Compared to most places in Europe, people there, they like to do their own thing more. Uh, and there's just a culture of that. There are places like that all around the world. Get a residence permit, get a citizenship there. I'm not saying store your assets in Nigeria or even in Turkey. I wouldn't have a problem owning property in Turkey, but you know, find more of these places. Don't do anything wrong. Follow the law. If you're an American or somewhere else you live, you have to report those assets, do that. Do everything right. But there's going to be more black swan events in our life, and you're going to want to want places to go. Robert Kiyosaki told our audience at Nomad Capitalist Live, three days, where are you going to be in three days where you can control your freedom? It could be a second home somewhere. Again, Nigeria is the stand-in. We're not moving to Nigeria, I don't think most of us are. You know, Serbia is a place that stands out. In some other ways, Turkey is a place that stands out. None of these countries are perfect, but they offer something different than what you're used to. And if you're sitting there thinking that people, you know, the government's just going to do what it wants... I think that's going to happen more in Western countries than places where people just have a systemic distrust. <laughs>